Amy Olwan, and her husband Stephen lived in Minnesota, but a nine-year-old son named Joseph. Amy worked as a dog trainer, and Stephen was an IT specialist. They were very religious. The two of them met at a religious college. Both of them belonged to the United Church of God. The church had very strict rules that its members had to adhere to. On the 31st of May 2016, there was a knock at the door. Amy and Stephen was very surprised to see two FBI agents on their doorstep. The FBI agents informed them that they have been looking into a group called Besa Mafia on the dark web. Besa Mafia basically provided a service on the dark web, where if you wanted someone killed, you could contact them, like hitmen. Besa Mafia had ties to the Albanian Mafia. The FBI agents then told Amy and Stephen that someone had tried to hire a hitman to kill Amy. A user by the name of Dog Day God contacted Besa Mafia and paid them $12,000 in bitcoins to kill Amy. Dog Day God also provided information that Amy will be away in March for a dog show and that they should do it then. Besa Mafia agreed and said they'll do it. There was lots of correspondence between the two, setting up different dates and ways of doing it, but it never materialized. Unbeknownst to Dog Day God, Besa Mafia was a fake group just taking money and not actually planning to kill anyone. Amy couldn't believe what the FBI agents just told her. She was a well-liked person in the community, with no enemies as far as she knew. Amy was then asked to make a list of all her closest friends and family who would have known when she left for the dog show. Amy and Stephen put up lots of security cameras around their house, and they had a police patrol the area to make sure they are safe. Then, on the 24th of July, almost a month after Amy learned about Dog Day God, she received a worrying email. I'll just quickly summarize the email. The person who sent it told Amy that she should end her own life, and if she doesn't, then he or she will start killing off Amy's friends and family members. The person gave details about Amy's family that only someone really close to her would have been able to have known. Amy took the email very serious, but because of her religious faith, there was no way she would end her own life, as that would mean she would go to hell. The email was also sent from the dark web, and it couldn't be traced. On November 13th, 2016, the police received a 911 call from Stephen Allwine. He says, I think my wife just shot herself. There's blood all over. The police hurry over, but it was too late. Amy had passed away. There was a few strange things about a crime scene, however. The gun was in her left hand, even though she was right-handed. There was still food cooking in the oven. Why would she make dinner and then decide to end her life all of a sudden? The bullet went through the right ear, which would have been near impossible to do with your left hand. The blood splatter was also something they found strange. It looked as if her body was moved. When the police used luminol, they found that her blood was almost everywhere in the house, surprisingly also in Joseph's room. It was obvious that Amy did not end her own life, but that someone else shot her. What I found extremely sad, that it was nine-year-old Joseph who found his mom and then called his dad. There was only one real suspect, Dark Day God, who contacted Besa Mafia and emailed Amy. The problem was that I couldn't really track anything on a dark web and find out who it is. The police did however notice that Amy's husband Stephen wasn't mourning at all. This of course doesn't mean that he is guilty, everyone grieves in their own way, but it was enough for police to question him. They checked in Stephen's basement, where he was working, and they find 66 electrical devices. He is an IT specialist, but I still think 66 is a lot. They took some of his devices for the investigation. They learned that Stephen was actually cheating on Amy. This could have been a possible motive. He was cheating on Amy with a couple of women, 
and it was clear that he no longer wanted to be married to Amy. But remember, due to his faith, divorce was not an option. The police also learned from his devices that Stephen was very familiar with the dark web. They found that Stephen had a lot of searches for scopolamine, a drug that basically renders your body helpless. Stephen looked all over on a dark web for this drug. Amy's autopsy revealed that she had lots of scopolamine in her system. It can't be proven that Stephen was the one that gave it to her, but a pretty big coincidence nevertheless. The name that Stephen was using on his forums looking for the drug was, you guessed it, Dog Day God. Using iCloud, the police was able to see that a Bitcoin code Dog Day God used was on Stephen's phone. It was now undeniable that Stephen was the one who ended his wife's life. He knew divorce was not an option. I'm not sure how his faith works, but I'm pretty sure that if it's wrong to divorce, it must be wrong to kill your wife too. His trial started in January 2018. It lasted only 8 days and he was found guilty. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole. I find really awful as Stephen actually let his 9 year old son Joseph find his mother that way. I mean it will be something that he's going to have to live with for the rest of his life. Forty-nine-year-old Sarah Lynn Wineski was living in St. Petersburg, Florida in 2005. She had recently moved from Sarasota. Sarah had four children and four grandchildren, but had no contact with them at the time. Things weren't good for her and she became homeless. On the 22nd of May 2005, a St. Petersburg woman called police at 11 p.m. because she heard a woman screaming. The next day a woman's body was found underneath the deck of a McDonald's. It was the body of Sarah Lynn Wineski and her family was informed. DNA samples were taken at the time but the technology simply wasn't there to match it to someone. In 2013 they were finally able to match it to someone, 31 year old Raymond Samuels. Raymond was already serving a prison sentence in Ohio since 2006 for attempted murder and kidnapping. His DNA was not only on the crime scene but also on the belt that was used to strangle Sarah. Sarah's daughter Candace Cheeseman had this to say. She was not living a life to be proud of at the time of her death. As a family we are not in denial about where she was in life but it is important to us that people know that her life was not a waste and not something anyone had the right to take from her. She was not always homeless and alone. We have wonderful memories of her, and her murderer stole the hope that we all carried in our hearts that we would have a chance to make more memories with her someday. Raina Ryzen was born on May 6, 1976 in Indiana. Her parents were Ben and Karen Ryzen. She had an older sister Laurie and a younger sister Wendy. In 1993, 16 year old Raina was a sophomore. She did really well in school and received good grades. She also worked three jobs, one of them being a job at a local animal hospital where she cleaned kennels and walked dogs. Her dream was to become a veterinarian. On March 26, 1993, Raina and her boyfriend Matt Alser had a date planned. The couple broke up a few months earlier, but they were trying again. Matt went to the animal hospital at 6 pm to pick Raina up. He noticed that all of the lights in the building were off and it seemed empty. He drove past a couple of times, but no signs of Raina. Matt soon became worried and drove to Raina's house. Raina's father Ben opened the door. Matt asked Ben if Raina was home, but Ben informed him that she wasn't. Raina's parents, her younger sister Wendy and Matt all waited in the house for Raina to come home. By 10.30pm Raina still didn't arrive home 
and they went to the local police station to report her missing. They were told that they had to wait 24 hours before they would be able to file a missing persons report. Ben gave them a photo of Reina and asked them to be on the lookout either way since it was so unlike Reina. The next morning there was still no sign of her and the family decided they could not wait any longer. Wendy started to call lots of people asking if they didn't perhaps see Reina or know what has happened to her. She called Reina's older sister Laurie and Laurie's husband Ray. The two of them both stated however that they haven't heard from Reina at all. The family also began searching around and put up lots of missing persons flyers. The police heard about this and started their own investigation. They made a public appeal asking for any information that leads to Reina's whereabouts. Immediately this resulted in the police's first lead. Several witnesses came forward claiming they saw Reina talking with two men outside the animal hospital. It looked as if Reina was arguing with one of the men. Some of the people described the argument as a fight between two lovers. Because of this, police decided to question Reina's boyfriend, Matt Elser. Matt told them how he went to pick her up but she wasn't there and he then waited with her family for her to return. The next evening, Reina's car was found. It was located about 9 miles from the animal hospital. The hood of the car was up. This initially made police believe that her car broke down. One of the police officers got inside and the car started with no problems. They soon realized that the car was staged to look like it broke down. The police also found Reina's purse in the car. Why would Reina just leave it behind? In the glove box, they found a man's ring inside it. Believing it was Matt's ring, they questioned him again the next day. Matt told them it wasn't his ring, but he might know whose it is. He told them about Reina's ex-boyfriend, Jason Tibbs. Matt also said that he believes Jason still wanted Reina. With this new information, the detectives went to question Jason Tibbs. He told them how he and Reina dated in the seventh grade for six months before breaking up. Jason also admitted that a ring was his, but had a reason for it to be in the car. He claimed that he was doing some work on her car. While he was working, the ring started to bother him, so he put it in the glove box and forgot to take it out again. The detectives also asked him where he was on a night had Reina disappeared and he had an alibi. He told them he was playing a game called fox hunting with his friends. I'll quickly try to explain what fox hunting is for those of you who don't know. It is basically a hide and seek but with people in their cars. A couple of people would be seeking and others would be hiding. Those who were hiding had to give clues to their location using the radio. Then the seekers had to find them using the leads. Jason's friends confirmed that he was playing with them, but no one actually saw him personally. A couple of days after this, a letterman jacket was found seven miles or so from where Reina's car was found. The jacket belonged to Matt Elser, but he had given it to Reina to wear to signify that the two of them were together. On April 26, 1993, exactly one month after Reina disappeared, a man was fishing with his teenage daughter. She got bored and started walking around when she made a startling discovery. The girl quickly called her dad over. In front of him in the water was a fully clothed body with two logs across the back. When detectives arrived, they believed it was Reina due to the clothes she was last seen wearing. Their suspicions was later confirmed. It was Reina Ryzen. This was no longer just a missing person case. An autopsy was done and the cause of death was asphyxiation. She had no cuts or bruises. The detectives decided to speak with Jason Tibbs again. 
First time he told police, Adrena told him something when they were dating. He told them that they had to look into Ray McCarty, the husband of Reyna's older sister, Laurie. They then learned why they had to look into Ray. When Reyna was 11 years old, Ray started molesting her, and two years later he impregnated her. Reyna had to get an abortion, and Ray received a three-year suspended sentence in 1991. It ended on January 5, 1993, just two months before Reyna had first gone missing. The detectives went to Laurie and Ray's house. Both of them said that they did not see Reyna on the night she disappeared. Ray stated that he was busy shooting pigeons on a friend's farm that night. The detectives called a friend and he confirmed that Ray was indeed with him that night, but didn't want to say anything else. This was not good enough for the detectives and they went back to Ray. This time, he told them what had really happened. He told detectives that on that day around 5.40 pm, he was looking for a house just around the block from the animal hospital. He then saw Reyna's car and went to talk with her. They had a brief conversation and Ray left. After that, he picked up a hitchhiker and took her where she needed to go. Ray also claims that the hitchhiker was why he originally lied in front of his wife. She did not fully trust him after what he did to her sister. Ray was the main suspect at this point, but there was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime, and the case went cold. It would stay that way for a year and a half. Indiana police pulled over a van driven by Larry Hall and arrested him for attempted kidnapping. In his van, he had newspaper clippings of Reyna and a prescription bottle with the name R. Ryzen on it. Larry claimed he was the one who abducted and killed Reyna. However, police discovered he was in Kentucky when she vanished and the prescription bottle was fake. Larry Hall was ruled out as a suspect in Reyna's case. In 1998, now five years later, the detectives didn't know what else to do and looked at the three suspects again. Reyna's boyfriend, Matt Elser, her ex-boyfriend, Jason Tibbs, and her older sister's husband, Ray McCarty. Matt's alibi was solid, and he never was a serious suspect. Jason's story of fox hunting wasn't that solid, because no one actually saw him. Ray's alibi of shooting pigeons was proven to be false, so they looked into Ray again. They got a search warrant to search his property. Inside his house, they found two handguns and a stun gun. Inside his car was blood. This is what they were looking for. They arrested him in May 1998. The new prosecutor felt, however, that there was not enough evidence linking him to the crime, and they were forced to let him go in 1999. For the next nine years, the case would once again be classified as a cold case, unfortunately. Then in 2008, police got a lead that would blow this case wide open. Ricky Hammonds, who was 14 years old in 1993 when Reyna was murdered, contacted the police saying he knew who was responsible. This is everything he had to say. Back in 1993, he was in the roof of his parents' house, smoking marijuana. He heard a car drive into the barn. Ricky saw his sister's boyfriend, Eric Fieldman, and Jason Tibbs. When they opened a the trunk, he saw a body covered by a blanket. He didn't realize it was Reyna, but he later did when he heard about her on the news one day. Ricky was scared to come forward back in 1993 because he would get into trouble for smoking marijuana. The police then interviewed Eric Fieldman and told him he will face no consequences if he can tell them exactly what happened. He accepted the deal and told them what had happened. Eric and Jason went to the animal hospital on the 26th of March 1993. Jason wanted to get Reyna to leave Matt and take him back. When she exited the door of the animal hospital, he called her over. She clearly didn't want to talk with him. Before she could scream, he pushed her into the car 
and Eric sped off. A couple of minutes later, Eric stopped her car and Reyna tried to run away. Jason followed her and said, if I can't have you, no one can. He then strangled her until she stopped breathing. Afterwards, the two of them threw her body in the trunk and drove to the barn. That is where Ricky saw what happened. They then disposed of her and drove her car nine miles away from the animal hospital and made it look like a breakdown. In August 2013, police arrested Jason Tibbs. He had a wife and kids by this time. He was arraigned by August 23, 2013. In December 2014, Jason was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Jason still claims that he is innocent and he is sure that Ray was actually guilty. Sherry Rasmussen and John Rutten married in November 1985. They moved into a condo in Van Nuys, California. Sherry was 27 years old. She was incredibly intelligent and entered college at 16. Sherry was working as the director of nursing at Glendale Medical Center. John Rutten was 25 years old. He worked as a hard drive engineer and had a mechanical engineering degree from UCLA. Their marriage was a happy one, but there was only one problem. John's ex-girlfriend, Stephanie Lazarus, wouldn't leave him alone. Stephanie and John briefly dated while in UCLA. Stephanie thought the two of them would get married, while John thought they were just fooling around. Stephanie became a LAPD officer. Even after Sherry and John got married, Stephanie would still frequently visit them at their condo and try and make Sherry feel uncomfortable. On the morning of February 24th, 1986, John Rutten left their condo to go to work. Sherry didn't feel like going to work that day because she had to give a lecture, so she was still in bed when John left. When John arrived at his work, he called Sherry to hear if she decided to go to work or not. There was no answer and he assumed she had went back to sleep. Later in the morning, he called again and still no answer. He then called at her workplace, but no one has seen her. That evening, John returns home and he immediately sensed something is wrong. He saw that a garage door was open and the BMW he bought for Sherry was missing. He goes inside and finds his wife's body on the living room floor. She was shot three times. It seemed like there was a massive fight in the house and Sherry also had a wound on her face likely inflicted by a muzzle of a gun. On Sherry's arm there was a bite mark which at least meant that it had DNA of a suspect. Immediately the detectives concluded that it was a burglar who was surprised by Sherry being home. There was a problem with his theory. The only thing taken was a BMW and that was found one week later. If it was a robbery, why wouldn't the thieves actually take something? When Sherry's parents, Nels and Loretta, found out, they called the lead detective, Lyle Meyer. Nels told the detective that Sherry felt threatened by Stephanie Lazarus and that she should be looked into. Lyle Meyer made a note of it, but Stephanie Lazarus was never looked into at all. Due to the LAPD pretty much viewing this case as being solved, there was not much being done in the next couple of years. In 1993, when there was a new detective assigned to the case, Nels would try again to convince him that it wasn't just a botched robbery. Nels asked for the DNA to be tested and said he would pay for it, but the new detective refused. In 2004, there wasn't that many unsolved cases left in Van Nuys where Sherry lived, so cases like hers were looked at again. The DNA sample received from the bite mark on Sherry's arm was finally tested. They didn't find any matches, but they did notice that her DNA was female. Only in 2009 was this case looked at again. Jim Nuttall and Pete Barba was now assigned to the case. They saw that her DNA was female and made a list of all the possible women that had problems with Sherry. The only real name on their list 
was Stephanie Lazarus. By this time, she now had a very high rank inside the LAPD. They followed her for a couple of weeks. Finally, one day, they were able to retrieve some of her DNA from a cup that she had been drinking from. It was sent in for testing and it matched the DNA found on a bite mark on Sherry's arm perfectly. They then interviewed Stephanie. She was trying to be smart, but she did let little bits of information slip. When she left, there were two police officers outside who arrested her. The trial began in 2012 and more and more information came out. The gun that was used was 38 caliber and is the same gun that Stephanie had at the time. Stephanie also didn't come into work that day. In March 2012, 52-year-old Stephanie Lazarus was convicted of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to 27 years in prison. She will be eligible for parole in 2034. Bonnie Woodward was a 47-year-old woman from Alton in Illinois. She was a two-time cancer survivor and she worked as a caretaker at the Eunice Smith Nursing Home. Bonnie had four children, but only three was living with her. Her 17-year-old daughter Heather was living with another family because she had an argument with Bonnie. The family she was living with is Roger Carroll, his wife Monica and their 16-year-old son, Nathan Carroll. She knew them through church. Bonnie was last seen on the 25th of June 2010 at work. Her co-worker saw her talking to an unknown man. The next day, she did not show up for work. Her co-workers and her boyfriend got worried since it was so unlike her and she was reported missing. The first thing they looked into was the unknown man Bonnie was seen talking to. They noticed that he resembled Roger Carroll a lot, the man Bonnie's daughter was living with. The police also found his fingerprints on her car. When questioned, Roger told police that he wasn't even in the area on the day she disappeared. Police had no physical evidence that he was involved and had to let him go. There was absolutely no other leads and the case grew cold. That was until March 2020. Nathan Carroll, now 25 years old, wanted to tell police what really happened to Bonnie. He told them that he kept his father's secret for 10 years, but recently his father Roger had begun abusing his mother Monica and he had enough. Nathan testified against his father. This is everything he had to say about what really happened. On the day that Bonnie was last seen, June 25, 2010, Roger and Nathan returned early from verification, leaving behind Monica and Heather at Nathan's grandmother's house. Roger drove past the Eunice Smith nursing home and saw Bonnie's car. He then said to Nathan, Good, she's working today. Later in the afternoon, Nathan heard 8 or 9 gunshots in the backyard of her house and he went to check. He saw his father with a handgun and Bonnie laying on the ground wearing scrub pants and white sneakers. Roger then ordered Nathan to start a fire. Roger picked up Bonnie with a front loader and dropped her in the fire pit. The two of them kept the fire going for days till there was only charred bone fragments left. Roger also instructed Nathan to destroy her phone with a hammer and mow over the grass where the fire was. Nathan complied because Roger told him Bonnie was a very bad person and she abused Heather. One of the phrases Roger used was, she needs to go away and never come back. All this new information led to a search of Roger's property. The police found a spent 9mm shell casing, a matching projectile and matching bone fragments. Roger was found guilty. He will receive his sentencing on April 23rd, 2020. It could be between 20 to 60 years in prison. Because he used a weapon, he could even face life in prison.
Adam Brandage was a 26-year-old father of two from a Quaker town. He had recently inherited a lot of money when his father passed away. With the money, he bought a house. He lived there with his roommate, Damon Smoot. Adam met Damon only a few months before buying the house. In October 2004, Adam's ex-girlfriend and the mother of his children got worried when he stopped answering her calls and he was reported missing. One of the strange things was that Adam's roommate Damon was still living in Adam's house all alone and was driving Adam's 1997 Mercury Cougar, which was his most prized possession. Damon told Adam's mother that Adam gave everything to him. Each time the police or someone asked Damon what happened to Adam, he would tell a different story. He said Adam went to Iowa because he was behind with child support. Then he said that Adam went to Wisconsin to flee an arrest warrant. The story would change a couple more times after that. Only this year in 2020 did Damon decide he will tell police what happened. On January 9th, he agreed to plead guilty and he told police everything. He told them how he was jealous of Adam and all the possessions he had. On October 4, 2004, Adam called Damon asking him for supplies he needed to fix something in the house. Damon told Adam to meet him at his workplace. There, the two of them got into a massive argument. Damon retrieved a baseball bat from his car and hit Adam over the head with it. Adam fell to the ground and started having a seizure. Damon then placed his fingers over the nose and mouth of Adam until he stopped breathing. Damon showed police where he had buried Adam. It took more than a day to retrieve the remains. Police are sure that if Damon didn't tell them that they were never going to find Adam. Damon was already serving a 10-year sentence for an unrelated crime. He will be eligible for parole when he's 62 years old. Adam's mother Donna Brandage says she knew all along that it was Damon because he was driving Adam's car and living in his house like he owned it, basically living Adam's life. District Attorney Matthew Weintraub had this to say, Adam never had a funeral never had a grave marker, just a tomb in the rock for 15 years, but I'm pleased to now say he's been returned to his family for a proper burial. James Essel was a loving father and husband living in Montgomery County, Virginia Beach. He owned the Sugarloaf Mountain Market convenience store. In March 1992, James's body was found laying behind the counter. He was stabbed 29 times. It was clear that he had fought hard for his life, since the suspect's blood was also found at a crime scene. This was the only lead police had, but DNA was not as advanced as it is nowadays, and they couldn't do much with it. In 2017, Police sent the DNA samples they had collected to Parabon Nanolabs. Parabon Nanolabs was able to make two images. One of how the suspect might have looked like in 1992 and what he might look like in 2017. This unfortunately did not help and police decided to focus on genetic genealogy to solve this case. They used databases to find family members of the suspect and narrowed it down. In January 2020, they narrowed it down to Hans Hewitt's. On February 10th, police collected a DNA sample of Hewitt's and matched the blood they found perfectly. Two days later, they went to arrest him at his house. They found him in his car. He had a gun with him and he waved at the police. When he was told to drop it, and he didn't, he was fatally shot. A neighbor of his caught it all on tape. Hans's wife believes her husband is innocent and is now working to clear a deceased husband's name.
Yara Gambarazio was born on 21 May 1997 in a small town named Rimbate de Sopra in Italy. Yara's whole life revolved around gymnastics. All of her friends did gymnastics as well, and she loved participating in competitions. On November 26 of 2010, Yara left her home at about 5.15 pm to go to the Brimbate de Sopra Sports Center, which was only 700 meters away. She was supposed to be only out for half an hour to an hour or so and then come back home. At 11 minutes after 7 that evening, Yara's mother calls Yara, but it goes straight to voicemail. A few minutes later, they call the police. Since it was unlike Yara to not respond to their calls and be out later than she's supposed to. The police soon arrived and also the military, which they call the Carbonieri. Hundreds of volunteers also helped search for Yara. The police tracked Yara's last movements. They found that Yara did make it to the sports complex and did some training. At some point after 6 pm, she left the sports complex, and at 6.44 pm, she texted a friend, arranging plans to meet up the following Sunday. At 6.49 pm, signals came from Yara's cell phone in a small town called Mapalo, about 5 kilometers from where she lived. A few weeks after her disappearance, the police thought they had found a man responsible. They wiretapped the phone of a Moroccan immigrant by the name of Mohamed Fikari. Mohamed said something along the lines of oh, forgive me God, I did not kill her. Mohamed worked as a boulder in Mapello. In the back of Mohamed's van, there was a mattress with bloodstains on it. It wasn't Yara's blood however, and apparently Mohamed's call was badly translated, so he was let go. Exactly three months after Yara disappeared, in 2011, there was a man that was flying his new remote-controlled airplane in an overgrown field that came across a lot of rags on the ground. He then noticed shoes, and he soon realized he was looking at a badly decomposed body of a young girl. The police immediately came and identified the young girl as Yara, because of her clothes she was wearing. She had a couple of facial wounds that was caused by a blunt object. Her cause of death was hypothermia due to exposure. In her hand was a lot of grass that she was pulling out in her last few hours. On Yara's underwear, they found a tiny piece of DNA that did not belong to her. They called the suspect Unknown One. Using the DNA, they could determine that it was a 95% chance the suspect had blue eyes. The police took DNA samples of every person that met Yara or could have possibly known her. In 2011, they found a man that had a Y chromosome they were looking for. The man with the last name of Garanoni was in South America at the time of Yara's murder, and his DNA was not a perfect match. So they knew it had to be a family member of this man that was the suspect. They found that a lot of people with the last name of Garanoni lived in a town called Gorno. They started testing DNA in Gorno of everyone with the last name of Garanoni. They came across a man by the name of Pia Paolo Garanoni, who was a 50% match to the DNA of Unknown One. This meant that a sibling of his must be the suspect. Pia Paolo's brother also only matched 50% to the DNA of Unknown One, and it was not their sister. Pia Paolo's father, called Giuseppe, had died 12 years earlier in 1999. It soon became apparent that Giuseppe had to be unfaithful for there to be another child who could exactly match Unknown One. The police used some of Giuseppe's personal belongings to get a sample of his DNA. They then found a middle-aged woman who could be the mother of Unknown One, Esther Arzufi. They found that Esther had a set of twins, one male, one female, and then another son. The male twin was a man 
by the name of Massimo Giuseppe Bossetti, who lived in Mappello with his wife and three children. After the police smartly obtained a sample of Massimo's DNA, they matched it with the DNA of Unknown One and arrested him. Esther must have been unfaithful to her husband, because the twins are both Giuseppe's. Interestingly enough, her third child was also not her husband's. On July 1st of 2016, Massimo was sentenced to life imprisonment. Pamela Shelley was a 31-year-old woman from Texas. She had a daughter that was 12 years old and a son who was 9. Pamela had divorced her husband and she was now living with a boyfriend, Ronnie Joe Hendrick. Pamela, her two children, Ronnie and his son, all lived together in a house in Texas. On January 6 of 2001, Pamela was busy packing up her and her children's belongings. Ronnie was abusive towards her and she wanted to go back to her family in Arkansas. She was busy in the bathroom when her two children heard a gunshot. They rushed to the bathroom to find their mom in a pool of blood. Ronnie called an ambulance. He also climbed into the ambulance to guide them to the hospital in the quickest way possible since he lived in a very rural area. This would prove futile as Pamela passed away in the ambulance. When the police arrived at the house, they encountered Pamela's two children who told the police that her mom would not do this to herself and it didn't make sense. Also at the house was Ronnie's brother, another man and Ronnie's mom who really pushed the narrative that Pamela was suicidal and that she most likely killed herself. An autopsy was performed and Pamela's death was ruled a suicide by the Bexar County Medical Examiner's Office. In 2008, Officer Carl Bowen reopened the case. He strongly felt that justice was not served and that suicide wasn't what happened. There was also a show called Call Justice that took on Pamela's case in the very first episode. They talked to Ronnie's brother, who claimed that Ronnie tried CPR on Pamela, which would not be possible since he had no blood on him that day. Carl Bowen then made a discovery but finally get this case solved. Carl talked to Pamela's ex-husband Jesse. Jesse told him that he spoke to Pamela on the day that she passed away. He said that he was talking to Pamela on the phone that day and then Ronnie took the phone from her and told Jesse that the next time he saw Pamela she would be in a casket. Ronnie then confessed and was convicted and sentenced to 22 years in prison. Joni Harper was a 39-year-old woman living in Bakersfield, California. She worked for the Bakersfield school system and she was also a Division I basketball official. On July 8, 2003, a woman by the name of Kelsey Spann starts to worry about her friend Joni, who hasn't answered her phone for the last three days. Kelsey decides to check on Joni and her three children. As she enters Joni's bedroom, it's her worst nightmare. Inside is Joni, her three children, and her mother Ernestine, who had all been murdered. Marquez, four years old, and Marshall, six weeks old, were her two sons. Lindsay was her two-year-old daughter. Ernestine, 70 years old, was a mother of five and also a civil rights activist. None of the neighbours had heard anything, and the police found no sign of forced entry and nothing of value had been stolen. The police only had one thing to go on. One of the family members was missing. Joni Harper's estranged husband Vincent was nowhere to be seen. Vincent was the vice principal of John C. Fremont Elementary School in Bakersfield, California. He married Joni in 2000, but in 2001 they had their marriage annulled because Vincent had been unfaithful. Then, in January 2003, they remarried when Joni was pregnant with their third child. Vincent moved out of the house in April 2003. Police quickly tracked down Vincent. He seemed devastated when the police told him about what had happened to his family. Vincent tells Detective Jeff Watts that he was visiting relatives in Ohio. 
There was activity on his credit card in Ohio on the day of the murders to back up his story. Vincent was 2,200 miles away when the murders took place, and he had evidence to prove he was in Ohio. They had no other leads, and the case went cold. They eventually went back to Vincent, and were surprised when he was no longer mourning and even ignored police. He could not seem to care less if police found the person who killed his wife and children. This led Detective Jeff Watts to take a closer look at Vincent's alibi. Receipts showed that Vincent flew from Bakersfield to Columbus, Ohio on July 2nd. When he got there, he rented a Dodge Neon. Vincent told Detective Watts that he only drove the car in the Columbus area. When the detective looked at the records, however, they found that Vincent had put 5,424 miles on the vehicle. When asked, Vincent had absolutely no explanation for this. Detective Watts was pretty sure that Vincent drove the car from Columbus to Bakersfield and back, but he had to prove it. Detective Watts flew to Ohio to have a look at the Dodge Neon. The car was cleaned by the rental company, so he found no evidence inside. What he did find, at first, seemed to be unimportant but would blow this case right open. Detective Watts found a lot of bugs in the car's radiator, and suddenly came up with a plan. He thought to himself that surely the insects could reveal where this car had been. Detective Watts turned to an insect expert, entomologist Dr. Lynn Kimsey. Dr. Kimsey starts by removing every piece of insect she can find on the radiator. She found a bright red grasshopper, which is native to Oklahoma and Texas. This proved that Vincent drove outside of Ohio, but not quite that he drove all the way to Bakersfield, California. She then found a paper wasp. The paper wasp got its name from the papery material it creates when building a nest. Paper wasps are only found in California. This was the evidence that the police needed. The question remained, however, how was Vincent able to drive to Bakersfield and also make purchases in Columbus at the same time? Detective Watts contacted the stores where Vincent made his purchases. He also retrieved surveillance tapes from the stores. What they saw was Vincent's brother making purchases and signing as Vincent. In April 2004, police arrested Vincent and charged him with five counts of murder. He was found guilty of all five counts.